Okay, so tonight, Be'ezra Sashem, we're going to be continuing with our series of Shirim on the concept of hope. And now we're going to be entering into the particular sugyos, the particular Bate Medrashim, the different Sadikim who speak about hope. Some of them explicitly, some of them implicitly. Ultimately, like we said in the Hakdama to the Shirim, this constellation of thinkers that we're going to attempt to show the unicity between them, the fact that they exist across time and across space beyond any theoretical conversation between the two of them or the multiple of them, nevertheless, to form constellations, to create unions or yichudim between these stars, between these different thinkers or tzaddikim, this part of what Rav Shemayim Morgenstern refers to as the Gula Satora, the redemption of the Torah, to show how all disparity is in truth a collage that discloses something greater than the sum total of its parts. But as we said, also, Lahavdil, in the name of Levinas, with regards to leaving Rosenzweig out of his book, Totality and Infinity, is that we're existing still within the universe, within the multiverse of Rabbi Nachman, who spoke so deeply about never losing hope, and hopefulness was part of the stamp of that derech chadasha di'u yeshena, that new path that is old and that old path that is new. And these constellation of thinkers are stars that exist within that galaxy. The tzaddik that we're going to be looking at tonight It's actually a pachad to speak about him. There's a certain anxiety about speaking about such a tzaddik. First off to say his name is Rav Moshe Chaim Litzato, Schus Yogen Alenu, the Ramchal. Born in 1707, lived an incredibly short life, passed away, I believe, in 1746. He lived a sum total of 39 years. Now, in those 39 years that the Ramchal lived, not only did he accomplish more than what it should theoretically take generations to accomplish, but he suffered very greatly. In preparation for talking about the Ramchal, I delved a little bit, very minimally, into the space of the Ramchal, into the biography, the biography of the Ramchal. And the sugya of the Ramchal's life itself is so deeply connected to the sugyos of Torah that the Ramchal was teaching, that it's almost remarkable to see the teacher of Torah and the ideas of Torah unifying to such an extent that whether you're thinking about the Ramchal as a person or you're thinking about the Ramchal as a thinker or an expositor of a certain type of Torah, there's such a blurred line between where the tzaddik ends and where his Torah begins or where his Torah ends and where the tzaddik begins. Now, already at an incredibly young age in Padua, in Italy, Ramchal, his, his Rebbe, Vishaya Besson, already points out that by the age of 14, the Ramchal had mastered all of the books in the library, up to and including Sifre Sod, completely proficient within the writings of the Arizal. And then already at a very, very young age, from the age of 17 to 19, the Ramchal collected around himself a Chabura, Chavraya Kadisha, very similar and almost modeled after the Chavraya Kadisha, the holy assembly of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his Chavraya who compiled the Zohar HaKadosh. And there's a deep synonymous relationship between the life of the Ramchal and the path that was paved by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, to the point that the Ramchal writes explicitly in numerous places in more of his censored writings that have survived in his Tikkunim Chadashim, that Rashi, Rashbi Ihu Reisha, Va'ani Seifa, that Rashbi was the beginning and I am the end. Rashbi in the Tukune Zohar wrote 70 perushim on the Pasuk of Bereshis Bara Eloikim, and the Ramchal in his Tikunim Chadashim, which were given over to him from above, are 70 interpretations of the last Pasuk of the Torah, of Lechol Hayad HaChazaka. The Ramchal already at the age of 18 or 19 was leading a group of mystics who were not only employed in their avoida, but they were employed as doctors and poets and literary figures of the time in this Renaissance period. And 
famous amongst his students were Rav Moshe David Vali, who was more of a Talmud Chaver. He was older than the Ramchal, although he was mavatal himself to the Ramchal. And another important figure who we're going to discuss a little bit more tonight is Rav Yekusiel Gordon. Now, the Ramchal at the age of 20 began experiencing what is described in the writings in the Zayar HaKadosh and the writings of the Arizal completely with precedent. This is nothing that the Ramchal was creating out of nowhere. But the Ramchal began receiving unconsciously Torah from a Magid, from a celestial force, from some sort of angelic voice within himself, some sort of power that emerges out of the individual's engagement with the process of Kedusha and holiness to the point that they merit Ruach HaKodesh, holy inspiration. And the Ramchal hiding all of this completely with zero interest in sharing or disclosing this to anybody whatsoever other than his Chavraya Kadisha, the seven to ten students that sat with him in that ghetto in Padua with that small base medrash. And the Ramchal began a project of writing a new Zohar. He already by the age of 20 had written 800 pages on Megillus Rus. And Ravi Kusiel Gordon, Ravi Kusiel Gordon, who was a doctor in the university in Padua, profoundly interesting individual, shrouded in mystery as well, much like the Ramchal's Chabura, wrote a letter to Vilna. He wrote a letter describing this remarkable individual at the age of 20, almost as if he needed to share the news of who the Ramchal was. He needed to share the news of what was taking place in Padua, that there was such a soul, there was such an neshama that had come down into the world, something that doesn't happen, something that rarely happens. And such an neshama was undertaking such a massive project and already setting up tikkunim and rules and regulations in his base medrash that there should be at every single moment of the day, 24-7, somebody learning the Zohar HaKadosh. Not for their pleasure, not for their sake, not for their merit, but for the merit of the Shina, To elevate the sense of the exiled aspect of godliness from this world. To quite literally suffer for God. To do everything within their power to engage in the holy practices and everything they could possibly do to bring about redemption, both personally and collectively. The takanos of the yeshiva of the Ramchal and the chabura of the Ramchal are, are, are remarkable. A remarkable document, not a unique document. Other tzaddikim, the Rashash, the Arizal, the Bashem Tav Akadosh, all of them also had takanos as to how their chevra would hang out, hang out, spend time together, be miyachid yichudim, perform unifications, which for us means draw the light of godliness into the world. But the takanos of the Ramchal's yeshiva were profound. There was no talk of anything but Torah. Anytime somebody felt that something was transgressing a certain line of discussion, somebody could clap on the bima and announce, give honor to God. Stop speaking about yourselves. Stop looking at the world. Look inwards. Look at what needs to be done. And Rav Kusiel Gordon writes this letter to Vilna describing what takes, what's taking place in Padua. This tzaddik, this 20-year-old tzaddik. And we're still 100 years after the, the shvira, the trauma of Shabtai Tzvi Yamachshimo. And so people were very worried about this. And once this letter was written describing the godless of the Ramchal, so that's when this whole polmus became. That's when the pushback and the infamous scandal of the rabbinate's response to the Ramchal. First and foremost, they told him that he needed to stop writing his books. Then they told him he needed to stop writing Sifre Kabbalah. Then they told him he needed to stop teaching Kabbalah to his students. And afterwards, they decided that it was proper to burn his books. The Ramchal suffered a profound amount of suffering. His, his life externally is a tragedy. It's a tale of tragedy. It's a tragic tale. A tzaddik who was misunderstood and mistreated, much like any visionary, Rabbi Nachman included. But what history has proven more than almost any other tzaddik is that the Ramchal was Kodesh HaKadoshim. 
that the Ramchal was the Holy of Holies. After this difficult time where his books were burnt, and throughout, in his letters, throughout, in the personal writings of the Ramchal, there is not an ounce of angst or resentment against anybody. It's all gam zulatova. It's all, this is also for the good. It's all, this is exactly what God wants. It's all, we cannot speak about what is taking place. Never once does the Ramchal assert himself to express any self-loathing, not self-loathing or self-pity, really. Never once does the Ramchal say, I've been treated wrongly. Every single step of the way, the Ramchal says, I'm going to bow my head in front of this wave. This is the hidden way that God interacts in the world. And he, and he swallowed it with pride and he did not raise his voice once. The only times that we see the Ramchal raising his voice was when one of the accusatory glances towards the Ramchal wasn't that maybe Chas V'Shalom, his teachings were rooted in Sabbatean heresy. That already the Ramchal wrote numerous svarim to disprove. In his letters and the Sefer Kinas Hashem Tzvakos, he takes every Zohar that Shabzai Tzvi and his Chevra Yimach Shemam V'Zichram took and misunderstood, and he shows exactly what those mean. But then there was another way of misunderstanding the Ramchal. They said, so maybe he's not a Sabbatean. Maybe his teachings come from the other side. Maybe his teachings come from darkness. Maybe his teachings come from the Sitra Achra. And his Rebbe, Rabbi Shai Abessin, who was the intermediary between the rabbis of Italy at the time and the Ramchal, who again, we're talking about a 20, 24-year-old at this point. The Ramchal gets upset. He says, I understand that you can misunderstand my teachings about my roots with Sabbateanism, and I've proved to you that I have no interest in anybody who transgresses even one iota of the law of the Holy Torah. He says, but the claim that I come from the side of impurity? Since when does impurity have such volitional action? Since when does impurity have such power? How could it be that these individuals, these rabbis think that evil in the world exists on its own so that it can act so mischievously in the world. Do they even hear what they're saying? Could it possibly be that evil exists without the reign of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? And it was specifically in this time that the Ramchal wrote so many of the svarim that the Jewish people drink from. Das Tvunos. He was no longer allowed to write in Kabbalistic language, so he translated Kabbalah into philosophy. Not only that, but the Ramchal was writing plays. He was writing grammar books. He was writing songs. He wrote his own Tehillim, books that unfortunately have no longer remained with us because of the experience. For the Ramchal and his Chevra, in particular, Rav Moshe David Vali and Rabbi Kusi Al Gordon, there was an obsession with redemption. Not as the academics claim that the Ramchal thought that he was Mashiach or that they thought that they were Mashiach. But I was, our tzaddikim point out, Rav Yosef Spinner Shlita, who I discussed to be mavarer certain aspects of this year with before giving this year, was not only the world expert in the Kabbalah Sa'ari and the Kabbalah of the Ramchal and the Kabbalah of the Bala Sulam, but also responsible for uncovering most of the manuscripts that we have in the, in the green writings of the Ramchal, along with Rav Chaim Friedlander, Skusi Aganalenu. They did not think that they were the ones to bring Mashiach, but their entire worldview was centered around redemption. It was centered around the hope towards things being fixed, ultimately. And within the writings of the Beis Medrash of the Ramchal. Now, it's not abundantly clear whether this was written by the Ramchal or whether this was written by his student, Rav Yekusi El Gordon. Rav Yekusi El Gordon's role in this Chabura was that Rav Moshe David Vali identified with the aspect of Mashiach ben David. The Ramchal 
identified with the aspect of Mashiach ben Yosef, as we're going to see, which is incredibly connected to the neshama of Akiva, Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Kusi al Gordon, who came from the Shevet of Dan, his Indian was to identify with Sariah, the general that we're told in the times of David Amelech, who will be involved in the emergence of Mashiach. The entire Indian of Dan, the entire Indian of Shevet Dan, the lowest of the Shvatim, expelled from the Anan HaKavod, caught with Avodazara in their lap, who were forced to be in the back of the line as the Bnei Yisrael were traveling through the desert, collecting lost objects, deaf, dumb, and blind to the point that Chushim ben Dan couldn't handle anything other than destroying Esav. Shevet Dan. When Yaakov Avinu gives the bracha to Shevet Dan, it's Yeshuascha kivisi Hashem. I hope towards your salvation. And this connection between the lowest generation, the lowest Shevet, and hope was so deep that Rav Yikusi al Gordon wrote in the name of the Ramchal something called Drush Be'inyan Hakivoy, Discourse with Regards to Hope. We're going to look a little bit at this discourse right now, at this Drush. And then we're going to see how within the writings of the Ramchal itself, this idea of hope is actually one of the animating figures that unifies all of his writings, which will hopefully bring us to a place where we can apply it to our own lives as to how to find hope in our personal lives, our collective lives, our present historical moment, as well as our collective experience in history. And to show how not only is this apparent in the Ramchal's writings in Nister, but it's apparent in the Ramchal's writings in Nigla, which is Mesilas Yesharim. The fact that the Ramchal nowadays is considered Kodesh HaKadashim. Who doesn't respect the, the book Mesilas Yesharim, Das Tfunos? History has proven the deep truth of the fact that the Ramchal was one of the Tzadik Hadoros, one of the unique personalities who came down to this world to interpret the writings of the Arizal, a number of whom we'll meet throughout this process of Shirim, the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, the Rashash of Shalom Sharabi, the Gra, the Vilnagon, and the Ramchal, these four Naharos, these four rivers that come out of Gan Eden to interpret the writings of the Ramchal in a different way. This Jerusha Kivoy begins as follows. Li Yeshuascha Kivisi Hashem. I hope towards your salvation. Reishis Habriya Betikva. The beginning of creation was with hope. Everything that was created is yearning and hoping towards God's expression downwards. The Pasuk says that Elokim, Bereishis Bara Elokim, God created the world. There is no beginning other than hope. The tzimtzum and the contraction and the limitation and the concealment of godliness only takes place in order so that creation and the void can yearn for that ray of light, that kav ein sof, to descend back into the world. V'zeh kav lashon kivoy v'chuka. Like we said in the first year, the re-entrance of godliness into the world, that kav, is the same language as kivoy. That the entire purpose of God diminishing himself, so to speak, of Hashem removing himself from the world, is so that we can yearn for Hashem. Had Hashem remained ever-present, had the infinite light remained as it was in its beginning sense, there would have been no room for anything other than godliness. The purpose of contraction, the purpose of the symptom was to create the possibility of a void, the possibility of absence, because only absence give us the capacity to hope. It's only when a person feels broken and sabrachan and if they're lacking something, that hope is born. The entire system of the Ramchal's Torah is all about this idea. For the Ramchal, the fundamental truth of existence 
is that God created the world, so to speak, in order to bestow the greatest level of goodness upon creation. That idea of chok hatov lehetiv, that the essential nature of the capital G good is to bestow goodness in lowercase g goodness, is made famous and popularized by the Ramchal. And if the entire purpose of creation is for Hashem to bestow His goodness upon us, Zakt the Ramchal, based on writings that preceded him, that for goodness to be true goodness, it needs to be earned through the actions of the individual themselves. Because if we receive the free gift of goodness, there's a certain shame inherent in receiving that which is unearned. That human beings who don't work for what they receive are alienated from themselves. They feel distant and removed from that thing which is coming to them. Rotsa Adam Bekav Shalo, a person wants what they work for. And we're going to see that the reason for that is because when we experience the reward of our work, there is no greater unity than us and ourselves. That when I exert effort and I receive reward for that effort, there is a unity between the expiration and the inspiration, between my rutza and my shov, between my moving outwards and that which I bring inwards. And so the Ramchal says, in countless places, quite literally, we're talking about a tzaddik who wrote more than 40 books that we have, countless more that are hidden in manuscripts and unpublished documents. The Ramchal writes countless times that that the true nature of God is to bestow the greatest power of good upon human beings. And if the greatest power of good is going to emerge, it needs to be earned. It needs to be through effort. There needs to be a sense of yigiya, of sevila, of tolerating difficulty. Because when we go through that process of tolerating difficulty, and working for what we receive, we will come out, on the other hand, so much more deeply gladdened and inflamed with the goodness that comes down to us. So the Ramchal says, and there's no particular source I'm basing myself on, but I promise you there's at least 20 sources for all of these ideas. So the greatest level of goodness is when a person works for their goodness, when a person works for their reward, when a person is forced to feel that they are the main actor on the stage. In order to necessitate that sense of volitional behavior, that sense of independence, there needs to be an apparent darkness. There needs to be an apparent constriction. There needs to be an apparent absence. There needs to be what the Ramchal describes as Hanhagas Hamishpat, the mode of governance in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows the world as if it is darkness versus light, or good versus evil, where the light of God is standing on the sidelines, not entering into the playing field. All of this is there to prepare the playing field for Bechira, for free choice. In order to create the possibility of choice, there is an ontological necessity of concealing the abundant light of God. The creation of darkness, the tzimtzum, all of it is to create that absent space wherein we find ourselves. And again, to make it personal, that absent space doesn't simply mean some metaphysical or abstract idea. It means all of the suffering, whether strong or small, that each and every one of us experience from the moment that we're born to the moment after 120 that we expire. The anxiety and the depression and the forlornness and the self-esteem issues and the concealment of right and the seemingly overwhelming presence of evil 
and frustrations and hunger and yearning that is unsatisfied, all of it is contained and expressed within that seemingly removal of godliness from the world so that human beings can actually engage in volitional activity. But the Ramchal and the same breath stresses that the existence of apparent evil, the existence of the apparent void, the apparent absence of godliness is temporary. It won't last forever. It is only so that the eventual unity that emerges at the end of history or in our lives whenever we recognize it will be magnified, will be doubled, will be potentiated, will be expressed in a deeper way than it could have ever been expressed had there not been darkness. The darkness itself, the Ra, the seemingly duplicitous way in which existence takes place, and Lev Yodei Amaris Nafsho, is all there so that the emergence of good afterwards shows that not only good is good, but bad is good as well. The apparent absence of God was also a revelation of God, but it was a revelation that allowed the individual to feel as if they were working through their own efforts to receive that good. That is clear throughout the writings of the Ramchal. It's what he refers to as Hanhagas Hayichud, the domain of unity, the presence of unity in the world, the promise that even though the world seems to have fallen in a deep dive, a traumatic breakage away from the original unity of the infinite light into the dark waters of difficulty and anxiety and pain and separateness and constriction and evil, Nevertheless, this middle period, this emtsa that seems to be devoid of the light of God, is simply to potentiate and make louder the presence of the yichud that will emerge in the end. Because it's only through apparent constriction that we give ourselves the ability to earn our keep, to feel as if, wow, it was our efforts that went through this. It was our efforts that drew this down. The Ramchal writes in the beginning of Mesil Sisharim that you want to know what this world is like? This world is like being thrown into the middle of a battlefield with bullets or arrows whizzing across your face. The existential dread of not knowing where the enemy comes from, not knowing what to be afraid of first. But why is that like that? So that we can find the greatest level of pleasure afterwards. So we see that the entire system of the Ramchal is the realization that yes, there's darkness, but that darkness is created so that the light that emerges afterwards is even deeper, is even more potent, is even more powerful. Because if it weren't for that darkness, there would be no room for hope. There would be no room for yearning towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There would be no sense that, oh my God, there is nothing left for me to do other than hope towards God. Hope means that my words have failed me, my ideas have failed me, my emotions have failed me. The only thing that remains is that irreducible sense that I hope towards that great goodness that God is going to reveal. The Ramchal continues in Jerusha Kivoy. That the only reason that the tzimtzum took place was so that creation should yearn and desire and hope that the light of infinity should return back into it. And furthermore, everything is created lacking, says the Ramchal. Why is it lacking? So that out of our lack and out of our deficiency, we should feel that destitution that gives birth to that yearning and that hope that fullness should descend from on high. Even God's presence in this world emerges as lack. But it's specifically lack, because lack is what gives birth to hope. Somebody who has everything we've said already has no desire for hope. Furthermore, Hadishayim Amdu al Pesach Akarka, all vegetation stood at the opening of the ground. 
waiting for the human being, for Adam Arishon, to hope for God to send down light and to send down rain. Hope is the engine that drives everything. Hope is only possible when there is a blockage, when there is darkness, when there is an apparent duration between the beginning and the end. We live within that middle period. We live within that emsa that is painful because we can't remember the beginning and we can't see the end. But the purpose of living in that emsa, in that arrested space of apparent hopelessness, is specifically so that human beings can cultivate a sense of hope a sense of drawing salvation down into the present moment. He continues and he says, The moon receives from the sun. And that is why the moon is created lacking, so that the moon can yearn for the influx of energy and light from the sun. All of existence is lacking so that it can yearn and that it can hope and that it can desire and that it can work on its own to draw these things down into the world. Tikvas emes, true hope, shehu habitachon shel haemes sheboitchin bahashkacha. Here the Ramchal is hinting to something that we're going to see throughout from other tzaddikim, that hope and bitachon and trust are almost synonymous with one another. That when I turn my eyes on high, out of the deep recognition that there is quite literally nothing else that I can do for myself, other than express my powerlessness and desire that something from beyond comes down and helps me. As we've said that hope is not about bringing the present to the future, it's about drawing the future into the present. As broken as the present moment feels, when there is no more recourse to any elements that can elevate my broken situation in the present moment, the only thing that splits that moment open and allows it to melt is the hope that draws the future into the present. That hope is the bitachon, is the trust that we have that even though the present moment seems broken, nevertheless, it is pregnant with the concept of possibility. Shahashefa nishkaf melamala that the influx of light, the influx of salvation, the influx of recognition or any success that we have in our lives is waiting for our hope. For the Ramchal, hope is the key. The entire world was created for hope. Hope is the mechanism that draws these things down into our lives. Further on, the Ramchal says, the choil ha-mekavet filo Anybody who has hope in God, whether or not you can utter your words of prayer, whether or not they're just thoughts at this point, they go directly up. Because in that moment of despondency, when you're stuck in the middle with no recourse to the beginning of unity or the end of unity, all we can do, as Rabbi Nachman says, is scream out from Sha'ol is scream out from that broken place, from that sunken place, from that dark place. And when a person cries out out of desperation, it becomes a tefillah la'ani that the Zohar refers to as the tefillah that is loftier than any other tefillah. Because it is specifically the depths of our degradation and our impoverishment and our destitution that creates within us that deep sense of only having one thing to hope towards which is the Yeshuas Chakivisi Hashem. Towards your hope, towards your salvation, I place my hope. Human beings have failed. The world has failed. The only thing left to hope for is to the Yeshua of Hashem. And the Ramchal continues and he says, somebody who perpetually hopes is always with a certain sense of joy without pain. Ki ha-mitzta'ir somebody who is suffering, somebody who is struggling, is always sighing and complaining. Assuming that there's nothing that can help them. But somebody who yearns and somebody who hopes, doesn't experience pain in the same way. Because he's always yearning and hoping towards salvation. That doesn't mean that the pain doesn't exist. 
That doesn't mean that the darkness doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that the apparent concealment of godliness is fake. But what it means is that even in the pain, and even in the constriction, and even in that low place in those meitzarim, tikva allows a person to confront it. Hope allows a person to face the difficulty with an awareness and a recognition that yes, there's a difficulty here, but nevertheless, I still hope that there is a redemption within this difficulty. As the Ramchal writes in his Ma'amar HaGeula, and he writes it throughout Klach Peschei Chachma, that the Geula is rooted, the redemption is rooted in the Pasuk of Samchenu Kiemois Anisanu, that gladden us as the days of our suffering. Meaning to say, the typical interpretation according to the Meforshim is that just as we suffered for your glory, let us take joy in your glory. But the Ramchal reads it in a very different way. He says, allow our glory and allow our joy to emerge specifically out of our days of difficulty. That the redemption is our capacity to look back on those days of difficulty at that time of Pirud, at the time of apparent darkness, and to look at it and realize that Gamzula Tova, that that was also for the good, that was also part of your unity, God. The apparent distinction, the apparent distortion, the apparent duplicity, the apparent double nature of life, that Mayim Mayim, that doubled water that Rabbi Akiva warns his friends from, that Rabbi Nachman tells us is the root of sadness, of seeing duplicity in the world, of seeing something doubled. Like we said, Rabbi Yikusiel Gordon said that the Rabbi Chal was from the neshama of Rabbi Akiva. Just like Rabbi Akiva only started learning Torah at the age of 40, the Ramchal only lived up to 39. Rav Arya Kaplan, Skusia Ganelenu, points this out in his introduction to Mesil Yesharim. Rabbi Akiva is that person who stands his whole life waiting. Kol yamay mitzta'er. All of my days I have been waiting and yearning and wondering, when will it be that I can reveal the unity of God? And at the moment of his death, at the moment of the deepest darkness, it's Rabbi Akiva who says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. That hero Israel, Hashem is one. There is unity in the world. Al Tomru Mayim Mayim. That is the entire crux of the Torah of the Ramchal. That there is pain, there is darkness, but that darkness is only so that the light that emerges afterwards is doubled and redoubled to show that even the Ra is a slave to good, and that no Ra exists individually, and that everything is part and parcel of the Hashgach HaVakadosh Baruch Hu, and that everything is part of the Hanhaga Sayichud, the mode of governance that discloses the deep unity that will eventually reveal that even that which appeared to be dark and separate from godliness is part and parcel of the deepest form of light. Our geula comes not from necessarily our good deeds. Very often we're without good deeds. Our good deeds, our geula comes from our hope in geula. Somebody who yearns and hopes towards God, even if they enter into hell, they have the ability to leave there. I don't think the Ramchal meant in the future. I think he means right now. As Rabbi Nachman tells us that this world is not a world, this world is hell. Everywhere you look, there's brokenness, there's suffering. You want to know how to leave that place? It's through tikva. It's through hope that even though I feel as if I'm stuck right now, even though I feel that I'm in that period between the beginning and between the end, prior to the emergence of the true Yichud of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I can still have hope and I can draw that yichud into the moment. Just as the Ramchal showed throughout his life. This was a person who was chased. His books were burnt. All of the gifts that he received from on high, the deepest secrets were forbidden to be revealed. And all he does is nod his head and say, Gamzu Latova. This is also for the good. L'yishuascha kivisi Hashem. The Ramchal wrote Taktu Tfilos, 515 Tfilos. Every single one of those Tfilos, similar to Lakute Tfilos, or Lakute Tfilos is similar to the Taktu Tfilos. Every single one of those 515 Tfilos, as Kabbalistic and as deep and as difficult and as comprehensive as they are, 
running from the beginning of the writings of the Arizal towards the ends of the writings of the Arizal, they each and every one of them end with the Pasuk, Liyushuascha Kivisi Hashem. Towards your salvation do I hope. As if to say that after all is said and done, after all of our fancy words and our fancy thoughts, all that is left for us is hope. The hope that God will give us a gift that we don't deserve. Which is what the Ramchal ends Mesil Sisharim with. That brisa of Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair. All of those dargos, those rungs of the ladders of what it means to become a human being, are simply the Ramchal's ability to describe the process towards which a person receives geula in the present moment of What's remarkable and almost unbelievable is that Masil Yisharim was written when the Ramchal moved to Amsterdam after his books were burnt. That's the capacity of this tzaddik we're talking about. That when they pushed him, he said, okay, I'll give you a revealed book. I'll write Masil Yisharim, which goes on to become the book of books. The Vilna Gon says there's not an extra word in the first 10 prakim says he would have walked a thousand miles to sit at the feet of the Ramchal. The end of Mesil Sisharim, the path of the just, after the 26 chapters, what it ends with is Kedusha, holiness. And what does the Ramchal write about holiness? It says you can't earn it. It only comes as a gift. You can't do anything to earn this. It has to come from without any preparation. Almost as if to say that after all of your work is done, after you've put in all of the effort, you come to realize that all I have left is hope. All I have left is the desire to receive a free gift, a matnas chinam. Because at the end of the day, all we have is hope. All we have is the hope that Hashem have rachamim. Hashem reveal yourself. Hashem, show us that all that is duplicitous and all that appears broken and the entire story of history, let it open itself up and reveal that it was all part of a singular Mayan. It's all one body of water. There's no distinction. The fact that we sit in the moment of apparent distinction just means that we haven't reached the end yet. But let us taste it. Let us see the end. Let us hope towards it. That is the crux of the Ramchal's Torah. And in this Drush Be'inyan HaKivoy, what the Ramchal reveals most clearly is that all there is is hope. The reason that the Ramchal was able to believe in hope so deeply was because the entire purpose of creation was to reveal the true desire of goodness that God has for the people of the world. That Hashem wants us to have oinig. Hashem wants us to find presence and pleasure in our lives. Hashem wants us to see His unity. And therefore, we can perpetually hope, even when we feel hopeless. There's always room towards hope. The world is always, always, always elevating itself. There was another tzaddik who we're going to meet. We're going to meet Rav Kook in a few weeks. Rav Kook also believed that the world was perpetually elevating. And that even though it appears that things are broken down and things are suffocated and things are dead, Nevertheless, Rav Kook would say, Viter, everything is moving Viter. What I want to read to you from is the last page in Kol Hanavua, the last page in the Voice of Prophecy that was written by Rav Kook's left, right-hand man, the Nazir HaKadosh. If Rav Yaakov Moshe Chalap was Rav Kook's left-hand man, the Gevura of Rav Kook, then the Nazir HaKadosh was the right-hand man, the Chesed of Rav Kook. And what the Nazir HaKadosh writes with regards to Ramchal is as follows. This is the 125th piece in Kol Hanavua, quite literally the last page. The Nazir writes as follows. The spirit of the Ramchal rests upon this generation in all of its various forms our generation, and all future generations. What we must do, says the Nazir, is we must learn the writings of the Ramchal. We must learn the takanos and the rules that he had in his yeshiva. That our learning should not be for ourselves, but rather to elevate the light of godliness and to redeem the world. 
to serve Hashem with truth and with hope and with fullness and with true love, without any desire for anything other than desire. Specifically in our generation, the generation of the beginning of redemption, the burden of the soul of the Ramchal and all of those who were connected to him is what we must connect to. The spirit of Rav Moshe Chaim Litzato, says the Nazir, emerges upon us and all of the enlightened ones of the Jewish people who spend their days and their nights studying his Torah, elevating with the strength of his holiness. The spirit of prophecy, the origins of the wisdom of the Jewish people that we need in order so that the future can renew itself and that redemption can be hoped for properly. So too, says the Nazir, with regards to the words of Rav Kook, what we need at this point, at the burgeoning redemption, at its beginning, to awaken within ourselves the desire and the hope towards that spiritual goal that stands at the apex of all experiences, which is Ruach HaKodesh, which is deeply rooted within each and every one of our hearts. The light of Mashiach, this new light, will emerge. From the storehouses of new life, it shall fill the world with light. New souls that are filled with life and yearning towards redemption, that emerge out of the ziv, out of the shine of wisdom in the strength of above. There's so much to say about the Ramchal, and this doesn't even touch the beginning, but suffice it to say that for the Ramchal, hope is the only thing that exists. On top of Torah, on top of Tefillah, when we come to the culmination of our efforts, Hakol Bekivoy, everything is in hope. And Be'ez Hashem, our hope towards Hashem for redemption, for Geula, for personal and collective fixing, should bring about the redemption that each and every one of us need, both collectively and positively.